Hi everyone. Um, before I begin today's lecture, I want to go over a few uh, quick things. Uh, as always, trying to just uh, make sure that we are all on the same page. First of all, in terms of the attendance in the emails that you send me, so I get your emails. I will not be able to reply to each and every email that just sends me the attendance order today. Uh, just go over the assumptions that they go with the assumptions that if you send me an email, I get it. But just in case, make sure that you save all those emails in a kind of your sent uh, uh, tabs or whatever, just to make sure. But I will not reply to each and every email of you that you send me the attendance word because otherwise I'm going to have to spend my entire day just replying to those emails. If you do send me questions related to uh, the final paper or anything of that nature, I will reply to those. It just may take me a day or two to come back. I'm sorry, I'm pretty uh, busy uh, being a kind of elementary school teacher most of the day. So it might take time, but I will get to it. On a more uh, positive note, or just more general note, uh, we are going through the regular exercise of what is today's background. So that was the background for Wednesday. And I got some a positive feedback for that, which I'm happy. But I want to try something else. So I will try to uh, do something else for the remainder of uh, our online meetings for the rest of us. But today, we'll start with this one. If you're ever uh, interested in why I have to spend most of my day as an elementary school teacher is these two uh, small criminals. So these are my two boys. On the right hand side you have Ido who is uh, eight today. He's in the third grade. And on the left hand side you have Daniel who is already five and he is on kindergarten. Uh, this picture was taken a couple of days after uh, we arrived from Israel so you can see the mess in the house and anyway that's the reason that uh, the house looks so uh, messy at the time. And that's the reason that I, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time to spend with you as my uh, students, but more I have to spend time with them. But that's uh, what we're facing now, and each one of us has its own responsibilities. That's okay. I'm having fun with them most of the time. Uh, okay, so uh, enough. Um, so that's going to be, I'm going to try and do some different backgrounds just for, uh, I got some feedback from all of you saying that it helps a little bit, makes you feel, if you don't like my kids as a background, that's fine. I won't be offended. You can let me know, but I will try a couple of different things throughout uh, the time that we're left with. So in order to start today's topic, I will again share with you my screen and we can begin. Today we will talk uh, less theoretical approaches and those kinds of issues and talk more about the two most prominent or most famous uh, terror organizations in the world today, Al-Qaeda and ISIS. Uh, but first of all, a quick review of course on what we did on uh, Wednesday. So we completed the discussion about the psychological and social effects of terrorism by focusing on mostly the security and civil liberties debate or dilemma, emphasizing the trade-off. The trade-off represents uh, how much does the public support different kinds of governmental actions that are intended to enhance security, but accepting the uh, price in this case or the cost, which is loss of some of their civil rights. Uh, the main paper we, I talked about was the Davis and Silver paper that used survey in order to test that, they offered two theoretical mechanisms to explain those changes in the trade-off. The first is the extent of threat perception by the uh, members of the public, as well as their, how much they trust the government. So their main findings shows that the conditional relationship between those two factors actually shape this trade-off. So the more, the higher the threat perceptions of the individuals and the more he, trusts the, he or she trusts the government, the more likely they are to support governmental actions which also means on some level uh, foregoing some of our civil rights. I also talked about the Garcia and Geva paper, which actually tests the same question, just using experimental design, which allows a lot more of a direct estimation of the effects. They also accounted for the effectiveness of the counterterrorism policy, showing that, first of all, transnational threats are much more uh, fitting to this discussion than a domestic terrorism threat. And when the policy is effective, especially against a transnational Islamic threat, the support for the policy is much higher, even in the exchange of lower civil rights, and less so for uh, domestic terrorism. The last paper we talked about was the Piazza paper, which focused on the rights of suspects of terrorism or uh, perpetrators of terrorism. And he tried to uh, test whether, uh, what is the extent of support for different uh, measures of interrogation or detention, and showed that Within the American population, uh, 
there is not a lot of support for extreme measures, but less extreme measures or some kind of different detention practices are more accepted, especially when you think about the uh, religious affiliation of the suspects. Those who are Arab or Islamic suspects are more likely to be uh, susceptible to those practices and the public will accept that in exchange uh, compared to right-wing uh, terrorists. So this is the issue. This is uh, pretty much covered uh, the uh, social and psychological effect. This has covered all these lectures that talked about how the public, uh, uh, how the public response to threats of terrorism, whether it is from political as uh, political effects, which I've talked uh, in class and also in the uh, first online lecture, uh, in terms of the voter preferences, and then the uh, social and psychological uh, effect. If you have any questions in all of these topics, of course, as always you are more than welcome to email them to me. So as I promised, we will talk about the two main organizations and we begin with the older one, which in this case is Al-Qaeda. So the interpretation of the name Al-Qaeda is, is in Arabic, it's called the base. Uh, the group's origin are in 1979 when the Soviets invaded to Afghanistan, December 1979. Uh, it led to a, a counter offensive by Muslim insurgents who were called the Mujahideen. You're probably familiar with this term, you've heard it. They describe it as filing a holy war, which is the term, the definition in a way of the word jihad, uh, countering the foreign aggressors, which at that time were the Soviets. Among those uh, fighters was a young uh, Saudi named Osama bin Laden. He met uh, Abdullah Azam, which is a Palestinian scholar and preacher, which also uh, served some time uh, as a Mujahideen in the war in uh, Afghanistan. And they began working together, establishing a global network of supporters and recruits in order to fight other holy wars of uh, foreign aggressors which invade what they see as Muslim or Arab land. In 1990, after bin Laden has already established himself as the main uh, leader of Al-Qaeda, he shifts the goals of the group in order to, as a counteroffensive, to attack the West and mostly uh, led by the United States. Uh, during the 1990s, after this decision by uh, Bin Laden, Al-Qaeda has been, uh, has uh, initiated some of, a lot of attacks, some of them the most famous attacks. So attack in Somalia in 1993, at that year also the first targeting of the World Trade Center in New York, which ended with just a couple of injuries. Uh, targeting an American military base in Saudi Arabia in the summer of 1995. Uh, more famous is the uh, joint attacks on the American embassies in Africa, in Kenya and Tanzania in 1998. And then the attack uh, using uh, an explosive boat uh, attacking the USS Cole with a suicide uh, attacker in the Gulf of Eden, which is right by Saudi Arabia and Yemen in uh, 2000. Those are some of the more famous attacks that Al-Qaeda uh, executed during uh, the 1990s. In 1998, uh, bin Laden uh, promoted his famous, uh, what's called fatwa in Arabic, which is a religious decree. Uh, he, was, he called for a global holy war uh, uh, as a result of against the West, focusing of course as the United States, the reason for this war was the occupation of Muslim land, which is mostly uh, was related to the uh, military forces, the American military forces in Saudi Arabia, as well as the harassment of the people of Iraq ever since the first Gulf War in 1991, and the support of the West and the Americans of Jews in Israel. So those are the reasons for this uh, religious decree. All this escalation process, radicalization, has led eventually to the famous attacks in September, in the 11, in September 11. 2001, the attacks mostly in New York and Washington, also the attack in Pennsylvania. So that's Al-Qaeda until uh, 2001. And I've talked uh, briefly, mentioned some of the more famous attacks after 2001, the attack in London in 2000, in the summer of 2004, the attack in Madrid, which we talked about in terms of the uh, effects on voters in 2005. And now I want to talk about uh, Al-Qaeda the way it is today over the last couple of years. That's what I'm going to do for the remainder of the discussion about Al-Qaeda. So today Al-Qaeda is facing uh, several challenges of sustaining itself as a transnational group. First of all is the, the international system and the way it is built. The system is based on states. Uh, and it's much easier for groups, any kind of group, to relate their identity to states than to just some kind of a transnational entity. It is also much harder to demand self-determination 
in a system, uh, it, it's, it's much harder for a transnational group to demand any kind of self uh, recognition of determination compared to uh, a nation group, a nation that in, inside a nation, in fact. That led Al Qaeda to adopt a strategy of uh, localization. It made its operation much more effective, and I'm gonna expand on that in a few minutes. But it came with a cost, which is mostly this loss of more of cohesive ideology of a transnational identity. It's no longer seen. It's very hard for it. It's not, it's not seen. It's much hard for it to uh, be perceived as a transnational that transcends border uh, entity or a group, but more as a, more, with, more related to uh, the local affiliations, which we're going to get to in a minute. Another uh, factor which uh, represents a challenge for Al-Qaeda today is under the context of a principal agent problem. So a principal agent problem is a theoretical concept that represents problems between individuals and uh, which delegate or which uh, provide a power of authority for others. So in the context of our discussion, a transnational organization such as Al-Qaeda uh, struggles to mount effective attacks in different localities. So it has to delegate its authority for all kinds of local uh, managers, so local regional managers. But those managers may have their own agendas, their own strategies, and they will promote them first before they promote any kind of an agenda that the transnational entity tries to promote. So in this case, the principal, which is the transnational group, Al-Qaeda, is having a hard time to control or to display the message that it wants through the agent, the local affiliates. You can think about that more easily in the context of us people who vote in elections and the politicians. We have our own agendas, the, th the policy actions we want to promote for us, but we vote for different politicians and they may have their own. They are the agent. May, they may have their own agendas that they want to promote. They're not necessarily going to promote what we want. So we are facing as principles, we're facing this problem that we delegate the authority to make policy to those politicians, they not they in turn will not necessarily going to promote what we want. They may on some level promote that, but on another level they may promote also their own agenda. So that's the problem Al Qaeda is uh, facing. Now, how does that Al Qaeda is changing itself, adopting to this reality over the last decade or so? So as we said, uh, as I said, Al Qaeda has been established as a transnational group. It is committed to violence as its central mode of action, and it always rejected any kind of political participation as a path for change. Now, today's challenges that we just, I just mentioned in this previous slide create a dilemma because there's a lack of fit between this universal transnational vision and the reality that Al-Qaeda has to operate within a state-based order. In addition, Al-Qaeda uh, over the last 10 years has weakened by uh, multiple factors. The first one was the global campaign against terrorism, which began in October 2001, right after the attacks uh, here in the US. There was a global campaign that uh, has been going on since then. Uh, another reason is a structural reason, which is the Arab Spring, began in the late 2010. Uh, it is the internal struggle of different publics across the Arab world. And first of all, it serves as a very uh, counter to Al-Qaeda's message or strategy because instead of promoting a global anti-US strategy, this situation actually promoted uh, the local struggle within those Arab countries. Uh, and it made uh, this a global anti-US strategy as irrelevant because the local Arab leaders had to face their own internal pressures from their own population instead of promoting and supporting Al-Qaeda's uh, message or strategy in this case. Another reason is uh, the rise of ISIS. It's more of an organizational uh, reason that led to Al-Qaeda's uh, weakening over the last couple of years. Uh, the aggressive approach that ISIS has promoted, and I'm going to talk about it a lot more when we get to the second half of the lecture today, uh, made Al-Qaeda seem irrelevant in a way and unable to provide the results that it promises uh, for Muslims. So uh, that's Al-Qaeda today.
All right, so those are the conditions that led to uh, the way that Al-Qaeda is. And the main organizational feature we can think about is what's called franchises. These franchises, this franchising strategy, those are local affiliates of Al-Qaeda that have been established in various locations. Most of them are across the Middle East. There are also some in Africa and Asia. The most famous one among them is the one that turned out, that turned to out eventually to be ISIS, which we're gonna talk about. Uh, those franchises are part of Al-Qaeda. They are related to Al-Qaeda, but it's incorrect to view them as what's described here as the false a force multiplier. It's not that all of them together make Al-Qaeda as an organization much stronger, but in a way it's exactly the opposite because the organization is not as cohesive as it was in the past. And again, each one of these affiliates may have its own uh, agenda to promote at the expense of the group itself, the, globe, the transnational group. So uh, the paper, the first paper that you had the reading for today is the Mendelssohn piece about franchising Al-Qaeda. And, and that's exactly what I wanna talk about over the next uh, couple of minutes. So this franchising or localization process uh, began uh, around 2003 with the establishment of uh, the first uh, uh, franchise, which was uh, it's called AQAP, which is Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. And then a year later, the establishment of an Iraqi branch, which was a local branch with joining the group led by El Zarqawi, which was killed a couple of years later, in, uh, captured and killed in Afghanistan, a couple in Iraq, I'm sorry, a couple of years uh, later. The main objectives of this uh, franchising uh, process was uh, it enabled Al-Qaeda to keep increasing its attacks against the American forces in Iraq during those years, 2003, 2004, mostly because a lot of the leadership of Al-Qaeda during that time was trapped in Afghanistan and Pakistan, again, due to the Western offensive. So the benefits was first and foremost, the access to Iraq and keep attacking the West, and also uh, keep itself uh, uh, relevant as part of the struggle in the United States by having successful attacks in Iraq. Now, some of those uh, local franchises backfired mostly uh, the one in Iraq, and we're gonna get to it a little bit uh, later, but I've already mentioned that in previous lectures when I talked about, if you remember the Sunni uprising, which came after a very a radical and harsh attacks by the Iraqi cell against a local community in uh, Iraq. But the next uh, uh, franchising uh, uh, affiliates that were raised after the Iraqi one were uh, established much more carefully. There's ones in Algeria and Yemen, Somalia, Syria, and some, and some more across uh, the globe. So from a theoretical standpoint, I've mentioned the problem of those franchises. So what are those risks actually? Let's think about those risks. The first problem, is based on the fact that Al-Qaeda has to delegate some of its authority to those local affiliates. So by providing much power to those local affiliates, you make them much stronger, but you lose the ability to guide them to uh, promote your own agenda. And that leads to the second point, uh, risk in this case, which is the different goals. Local groups may not have the same goals as the central leadership. For example, a lot of those local groups across the Middle East tend to focus much more on the internal struggle, the sectarian struggle between different factions in society instead of this global anti-US, anti-West strategy. So those is another risk by franchising. A third in this case is the risk for the status of Al-Qaeda. The image and its role as one of the leaders of the global jihadi movement may be uh, harmed by those different attacks of the local groups, the local affiliates. It also offers to those local groups the ability to operate pretty freely and describe themselves as we are operating under the umbrella of Al-Qaeda. We do not necessarily uh, establish or uh, push for the goals of Al-Qaeda or central Al-Qaeda, if you want to call that, but we are operating and we are part of Al-Qaeda. So that's a problem for its status as, again, as a global leader of, uh, of, uh, of the jihad. And related to that is the reputation cost because for specific radical atrocities that some of those groups may uh, implement, Al-Qaeda is being blamed for because they are related to Al-Qaeda. And the most famous one, as I mentioned, is the uh, behavior of al-Zakari in Iraq, which was a very strong backfire to Al-Qaeda and the local support in Iraq. Other than those more, like we can th think about those risks as operational size risks, we can think about other risks more in the context of ideology. So, <clears throat> uh, 
uh, the core of uh, the fight that Al Qaeda has been promoting ever since this was established was the religious ideology. It was not a national ideal, na national goal or ethnic goals. It was a religious ideology which rejects any kind of state-centric global system, mostly because according to that ideology, it prevents the Muslim from achieving their true potential as one Ummah. And one Ummah, according to the Arab and the Islamic interpretation, is one nation that follows the uh, rules of Islam. And again, based on uh, that, the, ideolo the, ideo the religious ideology also uh, has an overall objective, which is replacing the current system, the state system, with a universal Islamic rule not based on state. Now, this ideology has served Al-Qaeda very well, especially in the 1990s, and singled it out as a group with a more uh, large-scale goal, uh, fighting against the US, trying to bring to its collapse compared to those local regimes that were focusing on their own goals. But by adopting this franchising strategy, it serves as a very weakening point to Al-Qaeda because Uh, the creation of uh, the, the whatever Al-Qaeda was, uh, the uh, main achievement of Al-Qaeda during the years, until they began working much more uh, thoroughly on uh, franchising, was a great achievement. Why? Because they were able to create a transnational entity uh, based only on the religious affiliation uh, outside of the national context, resisting any kind of national orientation, a multinational religious group which doesn't have any bounds to any kind of national boundaries. At the same time, uh, local franchising may mean a much more effective resource allocation because you uh, uh, set the resources to the right places based on those different local franchises uh, that, that are focusing first and foremost on their own quest for survival, reminding you our organizational uh, explanation. At the same time, they come to the expects of a more global transnational agenda. And the argument is that over time, that kind of process of focusing on the local objectives and less on the uh, system level objectives lead to further fragmentation, disintegration of the original group. And some of those examples are the rise of ISIL, which turned out to be ISIS, and Jabhat and Nusra, which is one of the groups in uh, Syria. Now, uh, Al-Qaeda has worked hard also to counter this localization process on some level, to taking different steps. So one example is that in order to not be part of this nationalism uh, trap, these local, most of the local branches have names that do not uh, directly relate to the countries in which they operate. For example, so the group in Somalia is not called Al-Qaeda in Somalia, they're called Al-Shabaab. The group which operates in uh, Saudi Arabia or Yemen are called AQAP, which is Al-Qaeda Al in the Arabian Peninsula. So by distancing the name of the local branches from the name of the actual state, they are in a way countering on some level the localization process. Another method is that those local branches are seeking all the time to expand their operations and their reach beyond those national borders. For example, the group in Algeria, which is called Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb, which is the, name, the old uh, name of this area, it operates also in the West Africa in terms of both operation as well as recruitment. El Shabaab, reminding you, this is the local affiliate in Somalia, uh, began operating in other African countries. For example, uh, Kenya expanded its recruits and its operations beyond Somalia. So this is some of the method uh, that Al Qaeda has implemented. Now, overall, uh, if we think about the threat of uh, jihadi terrorism, it's more extended today because there's a lot more groups than in the past, and it is a concern in development, but is a much more local threat than a transnational threat. So we should not view the threat of uh, Qaeda as a transnational group. We should not view it as the aggregated capabilities of power of those local uh, franchises. And from our standpoint in the West, it means that the threat must be acknowledged, but in the right context. And we should not inflate the global threat but instead focus on those different local affiliates and what are the different interests that they try to promote each in their own area. Lastly, over the last uh, two years, Al-Qaeda has had some kind of a revival in its strength and expanding its power. Some of the reasons lead to that first is the uh, demise of ISIS. 
allowed Al Qaeda a lot, a much uh, more expanded access to resources as well as some of the recruits. Now, despite the fact that overall the number of recruits has been uh, reduced because of the global counterterrorism campaign or the Syrian civil war, still the access of Al Qaeda has been much as uh, has been pretty a uh, successful one. Uh, from a local standpoint, so the Arab governments, the weak Arab governments, some of them because of the Arab Spring, some of them because over time they were always relatively weak from a capacity standpoint, provided a lot of opportunities, greater, for, uh, greater freedom of action to uh, revive as a group and to operate. The American withdrawal from many areas in the Middle East mostly, again, provided much more room to operate for any kind of group led by Al Qaeda, which has a lot of uh, resources. And moving now to the countries in the West, so the rise of a right-wing ideology, right-wing movement has uh, made a lot of the political and social divisions much more evident. And that led in many of those groups to uh, emphasize anti-Muslim rhetoric. You remember a lot of the discussion we talked about right-wing ideologies and those, this rhetoric making it much more central to the discussion in those countries in the West, such as the US, many countries in Europe, it validates the message that Al-Qaeda has always been trying to promote. It helps it recruit more uh, supporters and it makes it much harder to prevent uh, people from joining Al-Qaeda or further radicalizing, radicalizing because the local Muslim communities in the West are less supporting or less willing to cooperate with any kind of law enforcement efforts. So the end result of this entire uh, dynamic is a greater risk of attacks, especially in the Muslim world but some of them may actually target U.S. interests. So for example, more a uh, higher likelihood of attack of embassies, American embassies in some of those countries in the Middle East or in Africa or in Asia. Uh, but the overall threat to the West and to the U.S. is much uh, less uh, uh, greater. So this discussion so far, these 25 minutes of discussion, something like that, has focused mostly on Al-Qaeda and its strategy of franchising. And now we'll go to the second half of this discussion and talk about ISIS, which is the most uh, famous franchise of Al-Qaeda. So ISIS uh, began uh, in Iraq in 2004 as an, uh, as an affiliate of Al-Qaeda. Uh, <clears throat> in 2006, the group began much more to promote sectarian war in Iraq, targeting the uh, Shia community, which is the majority, uh, after joining uh, forces with uh, El Zarqawi. In 2013, Baghdadi was uh, the leader of the group, renamed the group instead of calling Al-Qaeda in Iraq, it was called ISIL and then ISIS, uh, joined forces with other uh, former affiliates and actually uh, established the group that we know until today, which is called ISIS at some point in 2013. The leaders of the new, this new group adopted a completely different approach to its operation and expansion, while Al-Qaeda tried to emphasize the need for a secret uh, core leadership that will inspire a global uh, jihad. ISIS rejected that approach, so it is ineffective, and instead focused on a much more uh, ultra-violent approach, which mobilizing the Muslim civil society. And this one uh, impl was implemented by executing a stra strategy which means conquering land to establish its control, and inspire migration of a lot of its supporters to this area and further expansion. So that was the main uh, approach that ISIS has been uh, promoting, which is the, in a way, is the complete opposite of uh, Al-Qaeda. So the main goal, the main objective that ISIS has been trying to do in its expansion is the establishment of a Muslim society that lives in separation and outside the controls of any kind of uh, Western values. Now this kind of uh, uh, goal requires a very, uh, a very specific organizational infrastructure to support that. So that means that in any kind of the, in any of the areas that ISIS was able to conquer, they establish many social functions, school systems, banking systems, a judicial system, health systems, and other social services. And they were the ones who were responsible for many of those social services. This way, providing them more supporters. But it's not was also positive because this ultra-violent approach was also implemented internally. So <clears throat> in order to ensure the full compliance to the rules that ISIS has been promoting, it uh, collected uh, taxes using a lot of force from the people that lived in the areas under their control, and they implemented extreme brutal violence to uh, keep, to make sure that those uh, citizens are acquiescing and accepting the very strict rules of ISIS. Um, over those years, during 2014 and 15, 
they are able to win a substantial amount of territory, mostly around uh, Syria and Iraq. By June of 2015, uh, they declare the creation of uh, the Caliphate with Baghdadi as its main authority. And part of the uh, uh, this expansion that ISIS has been trying to do, other than just expansion by uh, gaining more territory, is beginning the online campaign of fear, releasing a lot of videos. Most of them uh, went on YouTube and across the news, showing beheading of foreigners uh, led by the American, again, trying to expand its influence beyond just controlling uh, more territory. So as a response uh, to this expansion during the summer of 2015, a multinational coalition was established to counter uh, ISIS. It included a lot of countries in the West, led by the US, of course, and but also some of the Arab countries like Jordan. During the fall of 2015, the involvement, the American involvement in this coalition was extended. As a response to this counteroffensive of the West to ISIS operations, it executed a series of attacks outside of the war zone in Syria and Iraq, some of them in the closer area like Turkey, some of them much further away, such as in East Asia, such as in Bangladesh, and the attacks in Europe, which we talked about some of them. We saw the video, the attacks in Paris, the attacks in Belgium, are attacks that happened after that. Uh, throughout, uh, since 2016, over the last three years, until actually until 2019, the coalition forces were able to liberate most of the uh, previously held uh, towns and cities in Syria and Iraq, as uh, ISIS kept uh, losing hold of its uh, territory. Uh, by March 2019, almost the entire territory has been uh, lost back to Iraqi and Syrian uh, forces. And in here we have uh, this map, which again, it's it doesn't have a specific date. It's somewhere at some point between uh, 2016 to 2017, but you can see the vast amount of uh, territory that ISIS held under its control uh, over that time, which is much larger than controlling the, the control that is uh, famous for uh, other types of groups. So uh, the second paper you had for today was the Clark and Mugadam paper, also talking about uh, ISIS uh, more specifically, but overall the global uh, jihad movement. So the rise of ISIS uh, since 2014 has turned the global jihad movement, the global uh, jihad world, into a bipolar system where ISIS and Al Qaeda are fighting over power on, and influence. Uh, despite the counteroffensive or the blows that it has taken over the last three or four years, ISIS is in, not in any phase of demise, and most of the experts expect it to emerge, especially in uh, Iraq or mostly Syria. Uh, in terms of the way it is today, it has been reduced in size, but it's still very capable, and a lot of its center of operation and its uh, more uh, sophisticated operators, operatives are still alive in, the North, in Iraq and the Syria area. Uh, future prospects of uh, the group uh, focus on its ability to adapt and evolve, and I will get to that in a few minutes in much more detail, but take advantage of the mistakes and weaknesses by any kind of the local governments in Iraq and Syria, and as well as the secure forces uh, in the area. So what they're doing mostly today is adopting this low profile tactic, uh, part of the understanding that this is their way to prepare to a uh, future uh, challenges and the way that they can reemerge uh, in the future, many of its operatives have gone into isolation, either in very isolated areas or within population centers, and waiting for the right time to reemerge, join the fight with the revival of the group. Uh, one of the central features uh, that ISIS has uh, shown is its ability to evolve and learn. And one of the central elements of that is its usage of the media. So, uh, the virtual caliphate, that's the way it was described in a way, their operations of using the media, uh, <clears throat> is employed in order to tailor messages to Western audience in order to elicit sympathy for the goals, but also urging revenge by some of the supporters. They remain relevant by uh, keeping themselves within part of the news cycle, encouraging Muslims to commit acts of terrorism in the behalf of ISIS. And all that ensures the ability to uh, recruit new members, including, including many uh, young Muslims that are using this, everything that's his online or in the media to revere the generation that came before them, the establishers of ISIS, 
they were able to establish successful Islamic caliphate, which today has been significantly reduced. But again, using this, uh, using this online and media platform, they're able to actually show it to them and again, to generate more support and more uh, recruitments. The potential uh, revival of ISIS in the future is also based in, on some, on some uh, structural factors. So the enabling structural factors that we talked about when we talked about the strategic approach for terrorism uh, has been some of the uh, factors that led to ISIS uh, rise in the first place, but there are some of the factors that might lead to its revival. So civil war, sectarianism, weak regimes, all those factors. Uh, some of those factors were crucial in uh, ISIS uh, rise, as I said, and uh, its ability to take advantage of local uh, social and political grievances of citizens in those countries, mostly the Sunnis in uh, Iraq and Syria. And ISIS is using those issues in order to further aggravate the existing ethnic and religious strife in those communities and actually to generate more internal, uh, internal fighting, which again provides more support for uh, ISIS. And further support is actually bought using uh, money and coercion from uh, tribes in those areas. When they controlled a lot of territory, they're able to control the resources and then use this as a, as a currency to buy uh, more support. One of the areas that provides the greatest uh, conditions for uh, ISIS to operate is Syria. So uh, it, has, it provides uh, ISIS with space and freedom to regain control, consolidate its powers. There are also factors that are not just the conditions overall, but focusing on the other groups. So remember the map I, saw, I showed you a couple of weeks ago of the many groups that operate in Syria. So those groups are mostly busy fighting one another, and that allows ISIS to regain some of the power that has lost over the last couple of uh, years, and to uh, put its different operatives in different places, and to resupply the lines, to have all the resources they need in order to reemerge. At the same time, the Assad regime is also very busy uh, finding all those different opposition elements and it paid very little attention to the growing strength of ISIS uh, over time. Now, now is the time where I stop talking about Al-Qaeda, ISIS and all those terrible things and give you the attendance word of today. So today's attendance word is printer, right? So today the attendance word is printer. Send it to me by email when you finish uh, with the video. All right, so this is the way ISIS has, uh, was established, the counteroffensive and, uh, and the weakening of ISIS uh, until today and the potential revival over the last year, year and a half with the conditions mostly in Syria. But what I wanna talk now is the potential future trends, not just for ISIS, but the overall to the global jihadi movement. So what are those uh, future trends? Why is it uh, more likely to rise in the future? First of all, is the ideology. For over 50 years now, the radical Islamic ideology um, has persisted and remains very powerful to, to recruit supporters and to justify the operation. Why is that? One of the main reasons is that the jihadists have proven to be very adept in adjusting their ideological prescriptions and prophecies to the changing circumstances. So the fact that the ideology is that powerful and remains over time will allow it actually to be the base for reemergence of this global jihadi movement, if on some of them, or on some level, some of them are weakened today. Another uh, reason is the decentralized structure, not just of ISIS or Al-Qaeda, but overall the jihadi movement, because there is no one single center of uh, operations for global jihad. And this is a very crucial uh, part which provides many benefits for the survival of the movement as a whole. First of all, in any place in the world, recruits can join any kind of group uh, that is participating in various, various insurgencies, whether it is in the Middle East, whether it is in Africa, Asia, even in the West. And this is where another uh, factor comes into play. The recruits do not necessarily have to join the fight. They can choose other paths, such as what was called, what's seen as a nonviolent uh, actions such as what's called the dawah. The dawah is, the, is more relevant in countries in the West, and this is preaching new believers that will join Islam, which later on you can, after they join Islam, we can radicalize them. 
Another uh, opportunity based on this decentralized structure is the fact that recruiters can join the ever-growing cyber forces of jihad. And we'll get to uh, cyber operations later on uh, next month. And other factors which uh, uh, supports the uh, potential strength of the jihadi movement in the future is its ability to uh, adapt strategically and tactically. So the main jihadi groups have shown great ability to adapt and uh, execute substitution between targets, between audience, to change its level of violence based on circumstances. It's shown the ability to sometimes cooperate between different groups. Sometimes those groups could compete with one another. And these groups have uh, shown great and divergent capabilities. So they're able to both uh, conquer and hold territory, such as ISIS was able to do. And they also showed the ability to implement a very uh, large number of methods, some of them more military, some of them non-military, whether it is terrorism, whether it is guerrilla warfare or conventional warfare. And the most obvious example to that is ISIS has been using since early on mostly conventional warfare or guerrilla warfare to conquer territory. Only after losing a lot of this territory, it switched to a lot to focusing on the terrorism as a tactic. So again, this is adaptation to the circumstances which will allow the groups to survive and possibly re-emerge in the future. The last one I've already mentioned, this is the conditions uh, in the area in which they operate, mostly in Syria. A lot of opportunities to uh, further ra radicalize the environment and recruit more supporters. Uh, those conditions, I've already, we talked about them and we talked about the structural factors and I've mentioned them, poverty, education, uh, sectarianism, limited state capacity, all that allow the group to uh, uh, potentially re-emerge uh, now and in the future. Now, the last thing I want to focus is uh, one of the probably most important features of uh, uh, contemporary Islamic Jihad groups led by ISIS, and this is the uh, ability to innovate and to adapt its tactic. And the most famous, of course, is the uses of the media, of the media and information operations. So the objective behind uh, this uh, approach is to uh, spread propaganda uh, towards the target population, but also generate uh, further support among the group's followers. The use of the media and uh, online uh, tools allows uh, groups such as ISIS and other uh, jihadi groups to implement attacks in the West, effective attacks in the West, in a very low cost, for example, uh, directing and uh, radicalizing uh, supporters that's gonna use vehicles to ram into civilians. So uh, remember the example we talked about, the attack in Nice in the summer of 2016, similar attack happened in Barcelona a year later. And that also has uh, implications for uh, the kind of recruits that ISIS is looking for. So when, they're th when we're thinking about their usage of the media, of online tools, of information operations, they're looking for uh, operatives which has the skills and the background in those kinds of tools exactly, which makes all the usage of the media and online tools much more effective, uh, especially compared to other groups in that sense. The related famous uh, implementation of uh, the usage of those tools is what was called the vir virtual planner model for external operations. That's using the media, using a worldwide globalization, a lower worldwide connectivity through the internet to uh, implement attacks. So it allows operatives in one location to direct attacks in another part of the world while using mostly internet connection and very sophisticated encryption technology. The most famous example, and that's what you have at the bottom of the slide, is the attack in Paris, and we saw that in the movie. It also allows them to use criminals in those local areas to be the ones who actually execute the attack. That way they do not have to sacrifice the very highly skilled operatives to make those attacks. They can just use criminals, provide them with the money and the directions of how exactly to make those attacks, and then they're doing it on the behalf of ISIS. Uh, so future prospects of these innovation tactics uh, means taking advantage of the progress in technology and the relative easy access to uh, commercial high technology, for example, the use of drones, 
the use of AI, so that's artificial intelligence systems, and the use of 3D printing. So I think it was last year or the year before, there was a case of a, a suspected terror attacks in Germany using a handgun that was made using a 3D printer. And this is a very important and, and uh, high risk over the last couple of years. Those kinds of tools are significant in closing the gap in capabilities between terror groups such as ISIS and other jihadi groups and more developed military forces that are mostly facing uh, and are intended to counter them. All right, so I did a pretty long, longer than usual uh, discussion of Al Qaeda and ISIS is the most famous terror organizations uh, uh, that we're known today. The last part of the discussion focused on ISIS and its media strategy, and it was mostly meant to be as a, a teaser for a Monday's, our meeting on Monday. You will receive a, more information about this topic, and this is intended to serve as a summary for the behavior of Islamic, mostly Islamic terror groups using those kinds of tools over uh, the last uh, decade or so. So with that, I'm ending uh, this lecture today and I will talk to all of you soon. Bye everyone.